All right, everybody. Well, welcome. We, uh, I'm uh, Pastor Jeffrey Ware, and, and uh, I'm pastor here at All Saints, and uh, we are so pleased to be able to host this uh, great event um, and to have all of you uh, joining us today. Um, this is an important topic uh, that, that uh, we need to be thinking about, discussing uh, as, as, a, as a church, uh, all of us together. Um, there are a couple of announcements as we begin. Uh, we're, we will have lunch at, uh, what does it say on here, uh, noon. And uh, there will be a, a free will offering. Um, uh, just to let you know that's to cover the expenses of putting this on. So your, uh, your gifts, donations are, are uh, greatly appreciated uh, so we can continue to do this. What, um, do, you, what, what do you write on? What do you <laughs> <laughs> all Saints, All Saints Lutheran Church, if you're going to write a check, yes. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Weinrich is, uh, is um, uh, a much-loved professor. Those of us who, uh, who attended seminary at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, um, I can say this, uh, in, in all of my time studying history prior to going to the seminary, um, history had been for me uh, facts, figures, and places, and names, and dates. <laughs> yeah. um, being in Dr. Weinrich's class opened up uh, uh, a whole new world to me as he not only taught us about all of those things, but made these connections, helped us understand the why, the theological uh, thought that was behind different movements in the, in the history of the church. And uh, it, it was uh, simultaneously one of the most difficult classes I ever had, um, but one of the most enjoyable, and uh, so it was a, a great blessing. Um, before I, I welcome him up here, uh, I look, would like to open up with a little devotion. If uh, you, you have hymnals there, if you want to turn in your hymnals to page 285, we'll have a little uh, opening uh, prayer, <coughs> responsive prayer to <coughs> Why don't we stand? Page 285. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated. Reading from Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> we'll sing a hymn, and I can't resist doing this. Hymn number 332. And as it was, as it was in the days when I was in Dr. Weinrich's class, we will all stand to sing the hymn. You still have it memorized? <laughs> Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Different text. I didn't pick it. <laughs> we sing. Savior of the nations, come, virgin son, make here your home. Bye. 
Page 285, with the Kyrie, O Lord, have mercy, O Christ, have mercy, O Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the lost name. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you. For you answer me. Hide your face from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with the willing spirit. Because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Teach me your way, O Lord. Unite my heart. That I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, 
that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. You may be seated. Let's welcome Dr. Weinrich. Okay, I'm going to put this on, right? But I'm going to take this off. Uh, when I left uh, Fort Wayne yesterday, it was 50 degrees. In my closet, we have our winter <coughs> jackets out. <coughs> so when I came here, it's 81 degrees, started airport, I, I have not packed well. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and this is also one of the reasons I, I Pastor Kanga's here, and they wear these clerical collars, you know. The problem with a clerical collar is that you can't open it. <laughs> so I'm going to open my collar and take this tie off, but it's hot. And so, there I am, all right? All right. We can turn on the AC. Has anybody? No, no, no that, that, that's all right. <laughs> if I really st start dripping sweat, turn it on. Whoops. <laughs> I'll just take it out here. I'm going to... There you go. Well, I thank you for coming because of the I understand. Yeah, that would be great. Because I, as I understand, Wake Forest has had some game today, and maybe Clemson. I don't know. They've got they've got a good year going. So uh, there's real sacrifice here, I suspect. Well, I don't. Uh, I inquired of. Uh, Pastor, yesterday, exactly how this topic came about, and um, and in a way, it was just kind of an interest in early church themes or something like that. Uh, and so, I'm not quite sure what I have prepared and what I do will meet your expectations or or not. Uh, my own doctoral studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland happened to be on early Christian martyr texts. And so I think in many ways maybe that commended me to, to Pastor Ware. Nonetheless, be that as it may be, I think it is equally clear that the West has moved into a very distinctly post-Christian context. And and it has done so in ways that, in, in my judgment, reflect what might be called macro-historical movements. You're not going back. There's no recapturing the Christendom of the Middle Ages. And nowhere is that more evident than in the palpable fact that the civic, the cultural, the legal, the social mores, laws, customs, that used to reinforce Christian, Judeo-Christian values simply no longer obtain. And so Christian values today, and in a way we're in a time of transition, it's not always evident. It's, here it's more evident, there it's less evident. But I think the trend is pretty evident that we are in a post-Christian society in which Christianity increasingly <coughs> is a minority. The more Christians are distinctly Christian, the more minority they will be. And that this Christian hobbitus, this Christian way of life and thought, will in fact increasingly be confronted by broader social and cultural ways of thinking and behavior that are in fact deeply hostile to Christian thinking and behavior. And this will, this will cause rub. And the more this kind of post-Christian, if that's what we can call it, this post-Christian way of thinking 
and behaving becomes ensconced in law, the more the potential of Christian being under the boot of the law will happen. And we begin to see this in our society already in some fairly striking ways. I was talking to your token Lithuanians here <laughs> uh, earlier, and uh, was telling them that for some five years I was in Latvia. I'd been invited there by Archbishop Von Augs of Riga to be the rector of their theological school. And so I had plenty of opportunities to talk to people who had suffered and had grown up in the Soviet system. And I was telling Pastor Ware just this morning that it is kind of striking to me in a way how certain <coughs> events in our own country have occurred that would do the Soviets really justice. Right? <laughs> You had a, a lady, for example, in Washington State, another one in Oregon, who did not want to participate by way of baking a cake or arranging flowers for a same-sex wedding. And they were destroyed financially by state power. Not baking a cake for a same-sex wedding cost one lady 140,000 bucks. Destroyed her business, destroyed her personal financial reality. That's intimidation. And that's how it, that's oftentimes how it happens. A person is crushed, others are intimidated <coughs> by the so, so I think we are moving into a time in which we begin to have to think about the potential that the experience of the early church may well be our own experience. It's not as far away perhaps as we think. Uh, given the recent Supreme Court case, uh, June 30th of this year in which same-sex marriage was again recognized as a constitutional right. Uh, you may be aware that Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, actually explicitly asked the Solicitor General of the United States whether should the same-sex marriages be recognized, whether the tax-exempt status of church stu uh, schools church buildings such as this, who refuse to fall in line might in fact become an issue. And the Solicitor General openly acknowledged it will become an issue. Three weeks ago I was with a, a conference in Michigan on religious liberty and was talking to a man who frequently attends various strategy sessions even with senators and congressmen and he reported that they were saying that that issue, in fact, is being openly discussed in the halls of Congress. It's not in committee yet or anything like that. But you might just want to begin to make some contingency thoughts <coughs> as to what might happen if that kind of thing comes down the pike. It's by no means a strange happening. That's exactly what has happened, for example, in certain cases in Canada. But I'm kind of divided my presentation between some reflections on early Christian martyr texts and then maybe in the afternoon a little more freewheeling about exactly what is the character of the conceptual <coughs> philosophical threat, the contours of the threat that we face and why that is in fact a Christian problem. The early Christians, of course, faced, by and large, the Roman reality. And the Roman reality thought of virtually everything as divine. You couldn't travel more than a mile without having mile markers along with deity, sacrificial little altars. <coughs> the Romans were incredibly religious. And this called into question fundamental Christian understandings. So what I'd like to do in the first part of the day, and a little bit out of my usual teaching style, because I will be recurring primarily to my prepared manuscript in this case, is simply to, to try to lay bare to you what was actually 
the, the understanding of reality. That the early Christian martyrs were working with that caused them not to sacrifice to the emperor's genius and indeed to assume to themselves a martyr's death. Because when, when you lay your life on the line, unless it's maybe like a soldier, but there's some ultimate commitments there. And for the early Christian martyr, what was that ultimate commitment? And what was the theological and real foundation and basis for this reality that demanded that you not apostatize? What was actually the self-identity of the martyr that basically called into question that identity if they do not submit the martyr? So these are some of the things I'd just like to lay out for you and in doing so, recur to some and refer to some early Christian martyr texts. Right? And mind you, I don't mind uh, questions or anything. If I don't make something clear or you have questions, comments, I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, that hymn, by the way, that we sang, Savior of the Nations Come, attributed to Bishop Ambrose of Milan, the reason Jeff chose that is that I required that all my students in early church history <coughs> memorize that hymn, right? Except it was memorized by way of the TLH rendering, so I, I had to use the hymn book. I was totally ashamed of myself. <laughs> standing in the back there with the hymn book hidden as best as I could. <laughs> well, <coughs> In many ways, the New Testament is thoroughly ascetic in its fundamental perspectives. That is to say, it radically penultimatizes all things earthly and historical. That includes family, that includes imperial and political powers of whatever shape or form, all economic structures, all relationships within the world are fundamentally penultimate. And the more one might get inside the New Testament witness as well, the more the martyrological undertones of the text can also be recognized. So we'll begin with such a text, namely John 15, 20, which is in the upper room. The place of communion in the body and blood, the body of Christ, where Jesus gave his last instructions to those who would be his disciples. He said, a slave is not greater than his Lord. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. In these words, Jesus foretells, even as he forewarns, that we live in the last days. Later in the Gospel of John, we are told that when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, to die. It doesn't mean, thank God, this is over. It means, in this death, the purposes of God have received their complete and consummated form. It's a very important Johannine claim of Jesus' words, tetelestai. That which God purposed for man from the beginning is now and herein completed and consummated. And it is important to note that this tetelestai is associated with his death, not with his resurrection. And so the resurrection of Jesus was not something that placed the death of Christ into the past. The resurrection did not penultimatize the cross. It rather revealed the content of the cross. Some of these guys who had me for early church, and Pastor Ware is very kind in saying that it wasn't just a matter of dates and place names and so forth, but fundamental why. I always ask the question, why did the early Christians say what they said? 
Why did they do what they did? What was that which impelled them to certain speech and certain behavior? And I would always ask this question, maybe you may remember this. Why was it that the Jews accepted the Old Testament as their own scripture? The fact of the matter is, to accept the Old Testament as the Christian scripture entailed the fundamental understanding of Christian reality as the fulfillment of creation. <coughs> In Christ, God brings his creation to that purpose which he had for it at the beginning. And so to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, was the creedal correspondent of having the Old Testament in the Christian canonical books. And the second question, which I always have felt was too little articulated <coughs> oftentimes. Why was it? that even though Christ was confessed to have risen from the dead, to have ascended into heaven, and to have sent the Holy Spirit, the content of early Christian preaching continued to be that of the cross. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians, I preach nothing but what? Christ crucified, right? That is the content of apostolic preaching. And apostolic preaching, or apostolicity as such, was a function of Jesus as Lord. The apostles were sent out from the Lord Jesus. And so what characterized the apostle in his own personal identity, as well as his own proclamation, that was of the Lord. It was the manifestation and revelation of how the Lord Jesus is Lord. What is the form, the shape of Jesus' lordship? Or if you want, what actually was the form and shape of divine majesty? In what form does God assume in us that bespeaks his presence as the one who has victored over death and sin? Early Christian texts concerning martyrdom are an answer and a crucial answer to this question. Because the martyr was not understood to be a victim of adverse fate. Bad luck perpetua. The martyr was not understood to be simply the victim of circumstances. The martyr was, in fact, when everything was said and done, the martyr was the manifestation of the crucified, risen Jesus. Now I'll mention this later on in this text, but from the beginning, okay, I have blue chalk here, I have white chalk here, and some other color chalk there. Right? The white is best and it's also shortest. Right? <laughs> so that means I can't use the black word too often. Right? You didn't bring any chalk with you, did you, ma'am? Oh. I'm very sorry for that because I could have used it, I suspect. <laughs> the Greek word for martyr is martus, which means witness. The martus word group arises out of the courtroom. And so a martyria, I'll a martyria was the verbal witness of someone in a court scene. The verb martyrepho was to witness, to give verbal witness. And so the one who gave verbal witness in a courtroom was a martus. That's exactly where we get the word martyr. Now what happens, and this takes place within the second century, so very, very early, and one can already see the, the antecedents of this in the New Testament itself. 
what happens is that the martyr or the martyria is no longer the verbal witness. 